Good day, Mr. Gorski. Leadership is under attack, which is threatening the effectiveness of businesses. Our intel has identified two agent infiltrators. They fall under the code names of status quo and complacency. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to eradicate these infiltrators as quickly and efficiently as possible. Time is of the essence. You must not fail. Good luck, Ted. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Hello, and welcome to the Leadership Edge. I'm your host, Ted Gorski. Leadership Edge is a show that focuses on leadership topics that are affecting leaders. And on the show, we provide two tools and techniques to help you deal with those issues so you can be more effective and efficient as a leader. In today's show, we have really a special mission. There seems to be, in my, in my coaching that I've had recently, there's been five deadly sins that I've noticed that it seems to be a jumping into a lot of leaders' lives. In today's mission, we're going to talk about these five deadly sins, but more importantly, what you can do to eradicate some of them so that you can be more effective as a leader. So let's share what these five are. First deadly sin is ineffective communication. Our second, ineffective feedback. Our third, is lack of empathy, or not displaying it. Fourth, what I call low energy cycles. And lastly, these things called negative triggers, which can get you extremely emotional. What we're going to do is talk about each of these particular sins and talk about what you can do to eradicate them because it's impacting your leadership. So let's start with the first. Let's talk about ineffective communication. You know, when I think about it, it reminds me of this quote from the late Stephen Covey, who said once, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. In any communication process you're in, you're always coming in with a certain perspective. But also the people you're dealing with are coming in with a certain perspective. Sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. But if we as a leader, it's important for us to understand that there are different facets anytime we're dealing with a situation. Because here's the thing I want you to realize. How do you know when your approach is ineffective? When you're talking to someone, what do you notice? You know, part of the thing here is understanding, number one, when you're talking to somebody, what are those subtle cues that that person may be giving you that maybe they're not fully connected in that communication? Do they look away? Are they maybe not paying attention to what you say? Maybe they're asking questions that you already answered when you've kind of talked to them about an issue. Do they kind of, do they have different body language issues that, that, that shows that they're not really fully communicating with you. So it's important as a leader to pick up on those cues because your style may be different than their style, which can cause conflict not to be connecting at full levels. Because here's kind of the process and how it works. In any communication process that you initiate, you as the speaker or the person that's initiating the conversation is providing some type of message which is in the middle of that screen. And the listener on the right hand side of that screen is processing what you say. And as a leader, there are three ways you communicate your message. First is through body language, through your facial expressions, how you're sitting, how you're standing, you have your hand in your pocket. It's also through your tone of voice. Are you loud? Are you soft? Are you fast or slow? And lastly, it's the physical words you use. So you as the leader are packaging up, 
up your message and sliding it across the table to the listener. The listener uses those same three key characteristics to kind of uncouple your message. So you can see what could happen here that if there are two different styles into play, how miscommunication can happen because of those three characteristics. But let's dig a little deeper here. Again, when we use talk about body language, we're talking posture, use of hands, and facial expressions. And tone, and of course, the words are the physical words you use. But let's talk about speaking and listening rates. You as the pre per person or the, the speaker who is presenting the information or starting the conversation, in any communication, you can speak at up to 150 words a minute. As I tell the leaders I work with, you haven't been any, at any of my family functions. Let me tell you, it's more than 150. But we listen at, believe it or not, over 500 words a minute. So we have the capability to listen even more effectively. But that gap of 350 words allow you to tune out allow you to be thinking about another objective, allow you to be thinking about picking up your dry cleaning or talk, thinking about what you're going to be doing over the weekend. These are things that are happening when those communication process occurs. Because here are the realities in any communication that you do. You cannot not communicate. When you step into a communication with someone, you are communicating in one form or fashion. You may not even say a word, but you are communicating something through your body language. So as leaders, we need, I need you to understand that this is kind of the process that's happening, that you are communicating at every level. The meanings are in the, are in the people, not the words, because the people are processing what you're saying. So the meaning comes from them that they are putting the meaning in what you're saying. And lastly, all communication is received, but only 70 to, 90, but 70 to 90 percent is filtered or changed by the receiver. So think about it. The receiver is filtering it and filtering most of it. This is why when there's different communication styles, the information doesn't get through. It's our job as leaders to understand the type of styles that we're dealing with, but I also need you to understand that you have to ensure that that communication is getting through. And a lot of the leaders I work with are assuming it's getting through, but they find out later, several days later, when they look at a deliverables they asked for, they look at it and go, what the hell is this? So it's your job to try to find out what kind of style that person is that you're dealing with to make sure your message gets through. Let's now transfer gears to our second deadly sin, ineffective, ineffective feedback. <clears throat> you know, uh, Ken Blanchard once said, um, feedback is the breakfast of champions. Our job as leaders is to give feedback to the people who report to us, who work for us but it is the most unutilized skill I've seen in leaders in my career. Leaders do not really fully understand how to really do this. Because here's the thing about ineffective feedback. First of all, it diminishes self-esteem. If we're not giving proper feedback, it really impacts that person's self-esteem. And the goal of feedback is not to do that. When that happens, it shuts people down. It threatens consequences. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Again, puts the person on the defensive. Uses negative language. You can't be doing this. You should not be doing this. Remember, the unconscious mind does not process negatives. So when you tell someone not to do something, they're act you're actually telling them to do it. So negative language doesn't work. It fosters defensiveness. What you use in effective language 
or ineffective communication, it makes the other person defensive. And I do not care if you have the best message at that point, you, the other person has shut down. And when they shut down, feedback will never get through. And it focuses on liabilities. It focuses on what someone cannot do. So you can see what happens when ineffective feedback. It causes literally a wall to go up. But when we talk about effective feedback, here are some key facets to that. It enhances someone's self-esteem. It helps them or makes them feel like they're worthy. That even though they're not up to snuff on something, we're still providing that type of positive feedback that's gonna make them feel they can do something. It affirms, stretches, and correct, corrects their behavior. And more importantly, it stretches them. Our goal as leaders is to develop people and make sure we're getting the most out of them. So we have to make sure we're providing effective feedback. This uses constructive language. Constructive meaning positive, meaning that we are always looking to make sure we're, we're helping them achieve the next level. So we have to really make sure we're providing that type of feedback. It fosters receptability, and more important, it fosters receptability in the person you're giving feedback to. It allows them to remain open. It, rem it allows them to really accept what you're saying. So when we foster receptability, you have a better dialogue, you have a better conversation. It becomes a two-way conversation. Unlike the ineffective feedback where it's a one-way street. And we focus on strengths. We focus on what the person can do. So it's important for you to really spend the time to make sure you're providing effective feedback. I have coached some people who have told me that over the course of the year, they had little or no feedback. That's just unacceptable. It's our jobs as leaders that's part of the job description to make sure you're providing feedback consistently to the people that work for you in your organization. So how do we do that? Well, I put leaders through what I call the good foot patrol or the greatness walk. And it's very simple. On a day-to-day -day basis, I tell leaders five to 10 minutes a day, you know, do you go get another cup of coffee or do you go to the, to the restroom? Well, during that time, I want you to walk and look for greatness that's happening and then acknowledge it. You know, we, as we are taught as leaders, as managers, I call it gotcha management. We're looking for something that's not being done. I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. Well, the greatness walk is the total antithesis of that. It's only searching for greatness. So if you're seeing something that's not up to snuff, during this time, you're not allowed to comment on that. You're only supposed to comment on what you're seeing is great. So if you allocate 10 minutes and let's say you find the first greatness in the first three minutes, well, now you have seven more minutes to find the next one. So think about it. Try this and do it consistently so you'll, you will get some great feedback from the people that you work with. And you'll see a whole lot of change in it, especially when I've, when I've done this for leaders or I've assign this task to leaders, they've seen great results. Third deadly sin, lack of empathy. You know, when we talk about empathy, this is kind of what I tell leaders, that empathy is, shows that you understand what the other person may be feeling or experiencing, but not necessarily agree with it. You know, I was coaching a, uh, an executive many years ago. I walked in his office and I asked him, you know, how are things going since our last coaching session? And he said, Ted, I just had to read the riot act to my director. And I said, why? And he said, well, because he didn't get his status report done on time. So I said, so what, you know, what, what happened? He says, well, talking to the director, what ended up happening was his son got, went to the hospital, had 104 degree to temperature the other night. And he was kind of there most of the night to make sure that his you know, son was okay. So I went, oh, yeah. I said, um, you get two kids, right? 
He goes, yeah, I have a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. I says, well, were they ever sick? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, were they, were they sick to a point that you were kind of worried? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, as a dad, how did you feel? He says, well, I was there to protect my children, and I felt I couldn't. I felt helpless, felt helpless, and it's, all I cared about was make sure that they were okay. It's like, oh. So what do you think your assistant director was thinking? And you almost can see him like, like slump in his chair. I said, listen, I, I get it. His status report wasn't done on time. That's a coachable moment. But can you understand where he was at in terms of his child being sick? So you can understand how they're feeling, but not necessarily agree with what's happening, be it not getting a report on time. And we talked about the coachable moment afterwards to have that conversation about not waiting to the last minute. Empathy shows you're human. Empathy shows that you understand where people are at. Understand the emotions. I mean, do you want to work for a leader who doesn't really care for you? Or would you rather work for one who does take a vested interest to make sure you're okay? I would tell you, I'd probably guess you would work with someone who looks at you as a human. But one of the things you can use to help you is what these things called empathy statements. Now, what do empathy statements do? Well, they have five key strengths of empathy statements. Number one, helps you understand you convey understanding. Convey understanding of what they may be experiencing. It helps absorb the emotion, whatever the emotion is that they may be feeling at that any given moment on that situation. It delivers with sincerity. When you deliver the empathy statements, it shows that you're being sincere as an individual. And it links the feeling to the situation, just like I did with the executive, linking the feeling of feeling hopeless and helpless to the situation of their son or daughter being in the hospital. And again, it doesn't mean you agree. It just means that as a leader, you understand. And there's a certain format to these statements. The first, the first part of the statement is the tentative, tentative statement, which is, you know, I can understand, or I see, or I realize, or from my perspective, I see what the situation's about. So you're acknowledging, first of all, the, the feeling that may be part of that. Second, you're getting into the emotion. It seems that you were feeling helpless and you were probably quite frustrated and anxious when your son was in the hospital. So what you're starting to do is at least starting to understand or show that you understand the feeling. And lastly, tying it to the situation. I understand why you might be feeling that, feeling frustrated and hopeless when your son was in the hospital. That statement of that format at least shows that you acknowledge the situation. You listen to it, and you're able to process it and condense it down. So the remedy here to help your empathy is to try to practice these. Try to put them in your leadership and make this part of who you are when you're getting involved in situations. Deadly sin number four, low energy cycles. You know, I've worked with leaders who, were, who have many times been running on fumes. And when they're running on fumes, <clears throat> not doing things to take care of themselves, you can imagine what's happening to their decision-making, their patience, their listening skills, their decision-making skills. It's not optimal. I've seen leaders who don't do anything to take care of themselves, and because they're running on those fumes, you're just running, it just, everything is just collapsing. Anything you do as a leader really have you, has you tap into your energy, what I call your energy gas tank. <clears throat> we all have them. Unlike your car, your car, when it hits E, will eventually stop, unless you watch that Seinfeld episode 
where they go past D and really push in the envelope. But most part, it hits E, your car will stop. You, as a person, as a human, when you go past E, the thing is, we don't stop. And we just continually move on. And that's when, when if we don't take care of ourselves, issues will occur. So the key thing here is we have to fill our tank, but how do we do that? Well, the remedy to that, to help you, is what I call what energizes you exercise. And what I ask you to do, challenge you, is grab a piece of paper. <clears throat> and if I was able to grant you a day off, just for yourself, not including your spouse, significant other, or children, just you, what would you do on that day? For some of the leaders I work with, a lot of them will you know, go for a walk at lunch. Or for some of them, they'll go play around the golf. Or they'll go in their garden. But the goal here is to create a list of activities that you like to do that just energize you. And once you have that list, then I want you to go in your calendar and I want you to put those activities in your calendar, at least one or two a week in your calendar. And here's the thing, these activities are non-negotiable, which means you cannot cancel them and schedule a meeting. This is your time. And the goal here is the more you do this consistently, the more that we can keep your tank as full as possible. So try this. I have seen enormous impacts with leaders who do this, both in their effectiveness and efficiencies, but in their mental health. And finally, number five, negative triggers. You know, we all have triggers, and triggers are those things that just cause you to get emotional in a, in a heartbeat. And you can imagine when that happens. When that happens, we come out of balance, and then when you're up here at an emotional level, anything you do will leave collateral damage. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, do disruptive emotions control you? Are they part of who you are? So if you say things or hear or, or think of things as, I'm always critical of myself, or I take things personally, or I am sensitive to disapproval, Or I worry constantly, even about things out of my control. You know, in my coaching, when I start talking to leaders and they start bringing up things, sometimes I'll say, well, do you have control over that? Why are you spending any time on it? Why are you leaving any brain cells to that? Because leaders kind of worry about a lot of things. So the key thing you have to ask yourself is, first of all, uh, do I have these kind of negative emotions? Do I have these thoughts? And they are impacting my performance. I guarantee you, you do. I just did a workshop this this morning with a bunch of leaders and we were talking about this, specifically how it was impacting their performance. <clears throat> so the remedy to this is what I call what triggers you. It's a simple exercise. What I want you to do is reflect on a situation you had recently, a meeting. And it can be either in the office or at home. And I want you to reflect on a meeting that maybe you didn't respond well in. Now, when I say don't respond well, I don't mean you yell and scream. It just maybe you felt it wasn't, you didn't properly answer questions or properly handle the situation. And I want you to be thinking about what triggers were there. Remember, triggers can be a word, a phrase, can be a tone of voice, can be a look. So I want you to really reflect on kind of the whole concept of what those triggers are. And here is the thing. This is an exercise that I really want you to be doing consistently from this point forward. Anytime you are in a meeting and you don't think you responded properly, immediately sit down and say, okay, was there a trigger there that didn't help me get to stay in high levels of performance? The more you identify, the less power they have over you. Because these type of triggers, 
Once they get a hold of you, they're unconscious and will bring you to a point of being unbalanced or emotional. So do this journey and really try to find out your, your negative triggers. So in wrapping up today's show, all great leaders work through these issues to make them work for themselves. Will you? Your mission today, if you choose to accept it, is to look at one of these five deadly sins. And if, you, if these are ones that are impacting you, try some of the activities that we discussed in today's show. I promise you, you'll see some positive impacts from do that. And if you have a couple that we've talked about today that you say to yourself, yeah, I gotta do that, prioritize and then work on one before you work on the other. I guarantee you, if you work on these five deadly sins and try to, try to resolve them, it will have positive impacts to your leadership. So in closing, if there's anything we can do to help you with your leadership needs, please reach out to us at www.getyouredge.com. And we'd love to talk to you to see what we could do to kind of help. So again, my name is Ted Gorski. Thanks for watching the show today. And looking forward to our next show, where you'll get your next mission on the Leadership Edge.